Islam came to protect society from criminals and not to protect criminals at the expense of society part 1. The rights of society versus the right of the criminal. Verily I sent my messengers with clear evidence and manifest proof, and sent down books with them and the balance, so that people would uphold justice. I also sent down iron in which there is great strength, armor is made from it, together with it having many other benefits for the people in their manufacturing and handicrafts. And also because Allah can make it obvious to the people who it is that supports him and his messengers in secret. Indeed, Allah is strong and almighty, nothing can overcome his decree nor is he incapable of doing anything. Al-Hadid 25 Part 1 There is no news like bad news. On December 4, 2015, the BBC website released an article titled, Saudi Arabia carrying out unprecedented wave of executions. The article started by informing us that, Saudi Arabia's use of the death penalty has sparked international alarm, and that, the country's human rights record has been back in the news since January. When liberal blogger Raif Badawi was flogged after being convicted of insulting Islam. The two key terms in the aforementioned quotes are human rights, and liberal. Because through the lens of liberalism we get a particular brand of human rights that fuels Western contempt for Saudi Islam's legal punishments. However, before a robust appeal can be made to either of these two terms, it first needs to be established who and what gets to define the particularities of human rights to begin with. Another interesting part of this BBC piece is the unprecedented wave of executions. This quote is interesting because it has two possible interpretations. 1. The obvious interpretation, there has been an unprecedented wave of executions because there has been an influx of criminal cases which demonstrates nothing more than cause and effect. 2. The not-so-obvious interpretation, there has been an unprecedented wave of executions because Saudi's implementation of its legal punishments are simply barbaric, bloodthirsty and despotic. If the second interpretation is the correct one then why is the rule of thumb not applied to China? A report released last month, 2013, by the human rights group Amnesty International said that, as in previous years, China executed more people last year than the rest of the world combined. Another interesting fact about China is that, there are 46 criminal offences that are eligible for the death penalty. Many of these offences are non-violent and economic criminal offences. Offences in China We will go out on a limb and opt for the second option because, 1, it is the purpose of this paper to investigate Western attitudes towards Saudi's legal punishments and, 2, given the current climate. Saudi's legal punishments are ripe for the annual kicking. The article then goes on to state. So far this year, more than 150 people have been executed the highest figure recorded by human rights groups for 20 years, not only is this yellow journalism. It is also simply not true according to Amnesty International, who make it their business to globally observe human rights standards. Amnesty International states regarding the top execution as China. China again carried out more executions than the rest of the world put together. Amnesty International believes thousands are executed and sentenced to death there every year. But with numbers kept a state secret the true figure is impossible to determine. Amnesty International goes on to state. The other countries making up the world's top five executioners in 2014 were Iran, 289 officially announced and at least 454 more that were not acknowledged by the authorities. Saudi Arabia, at least 90, Iraq, at least 61, and the USA, 35. Dozens of them were convicted of non-violent crimes, including drug offenses. In the World Report of Rulants and Health, it describes violence as three types, 1. Self-directed violence, including suicidal behavior and self-abuse. Two, interpersonal violence, family and partner or community violence, acquaintance or stranger. Three, collective violence, social, political and economic. Human rights activists say many of the trials were unfair. Back in the 90s, the British national newspaper, The Guardian, released an advert. That visually reminded us to factor in all points of view so that we can develop for ourselves the whole picture before passing judgment. This is a good piece of journalistic advice that all news outlets should endeavor to employ. If we go back to the BBC quote at the top of our paper, we will see many usages of the passive voice. So far this year, more than 150 people have been executed, and dozens of them were convicted of non-violent crimes. Sometimes we use the passive voice to psychologically distance ourselves from disturbing things, on other occasions, we use it to mentally herd the masses to an abstract place. 
the two above examples place more emphasis on the idea of punishment than they do on the reasons and justifications that led to the punishment. When you remove causation from the equation, punishment, when isolated, is always going to seem disproportionate and excessive. If you walked in the room just as a parent smacked their child, this action, in the absence of its reason, is always going to elicit a negative and an emotional response. Actually, the way the society is heading, even if you come to know the possible vindicating reason, it could still elicit an emotional and reprimanding. It is obvious from the tone of the article, which is shaped by the current global climate, that the BBC is opportunistically finding fault with Saudi's legal punishment system. However, what is not so obvious, and thus taken for granted, is this highly contemptuous and cynical view of Saudi's legal punishments is shaped by Western constructs of human rights and liberal notions of justice. It is a natural byproduct of human behavior and social conditioning to defend and fight for the ideals and constructs that we were raised or have chosen to believe in. However, due to the incidental elements involved in social conditioning that shape our ideals, there is no given guarantee that the our ideals and constructs represent the truth. Objectively speaking, what makes Western notions of justice and human rights superior to Eastern notions of justice and human rights? Is it advancement that provides the voice of superiority, when advancement, crudely put, is nothing more than the motion of moving forward? I am sure we all know that not every advancement is necessarily a case of progression, on the contrary, it could be a case of regression. Obviously, advancement is a necessary component of technology and science. But why must it be a necessary component of legal punishments which are predicated on moral rights and wrongs and social deterrents which have existed since time immemorial? Is it the default to change moral rights and wrongs merely because we are moving forward in time? Granted, technology and science progress with time, however, our developments, including technology, have ironically also enabled us to regress with time. For argument's sake, let us say right now that even if Saudi's legal punishments were barbaric and socially unfit for the 21-inch century, would that be a technical knockout for Western notions of justice and human rights, proving that such concepts stand supreme? What if we could bring examples to demonstrate that certain Western justice systems have completely missed the mark when it comes to justice and human rights? What if we could bring a catalogue of legal cases to show how the West is more concerned with the rights of the criminal than the rights of the victim and the society in general? Granted, such an argument would not prove the Saudi or the Islamic position as right, but it would definitely suggest that Western models of human rights and justice are at least equally problematic. Albeit for different reasons. Case in point. In 2002, Michael Wheatley, a.k.a. The Skullcracker, was sentenced to 13 life sentences at the Old Bailey for a string of vicious armed raids on banks and building societies. He notoriously earned his nickname, The Skullcracker, thanks to a firearm he would use to pistol whip his victims around the head with. One of these victims was a 73-year-old woman. However, the year 2002 was not the year when Wheatley decided to embark on his brutal criminal spree. Rather, Wheatley had been terrorizing the public and robbing banks since the 1980s. In the mid-80s, Wheatley was sentenced to nine years for a raid on a post office. However, in 1988, whilst still incarcerated, he absconded from a hospital and committed nine armed robberies while at large. When he was finally apprehended, he was sentenced to a further 16-year sentence to add to his previous sentence of nine years. But the legal system decided to reduce his sentence to 11 years on appeal. You would think at this point that the criminal system and prison authorities would have learned a valuable lesson, but for some reason, unbeknownst to us, and perhaps them. They remarkably decided to let Wheatley visit an outside optician. Once again, Wheatley performed one of his Houdini acts and escaped to carry out eight armed robberies. When Wheatley was finally apprehended, once again, a further seven years was handed down to him on top of the twenty he had left to serve. Now, you might have to read the second part of this compounded sentence twice to stave off denial, but in 2001, Wheatley, the career criminal, was released on parole. In a matter of weeks, Wheatley, who once proudly announced to the judge his profession as a bank robber, was holding up banks and brutally bashing victims with a blank firing semi-automatic pistol. Once again, you would think that when the judge passed down 13 life sentences in 2002 that Wheatley would never again see the light of day. The justice system, in its wisdom, decided to give Wheatley a minimum tariff of just eight years. This catalogue of errors, which spanned three decades, 
culminated in the justice system placing Wheatley in an open prison that enabled him to start his violent version of Groundhog Day all over again. One could quite easily use this case and many other cases to argue that certain Western justice systems are not only woefully negligent in their application of their legal punishments but more importantly, are a. woefully negligent in protecting the rights of citizens and b. fail miserably as deterrents. If this much is true, then it would go a long way in explaining why the West has such a harsh view of Saudi's legal punishments because negligence has a tendency to view vigilance as severe and unforgiving. Just as a negligent parent views a vigilant parent as severe and unforgiving. This could be no more than one extreme judging another perceived extreme. Think about it, if someone is ultra-liberal in his or her ways then the mildest form of conservatism could be easily perceived as extremism. In any case, this is nothing more than a game of tit for tat, and at best, it proves little more than a double standard but does not prove the opposing argument as night. This stalemate leaves us little recourse but to explore the frontiers of human rights and concepts of justice in the framework of life and its purpose. Another Western example of an extreme laxity in law is personified by the notorious Mexican drug kingpin Joaquin El Chapo Guzman. This piece of trash, who boasted and bragged about being the world's leading supplier of heroin, methamphetamine, cocaine and marijuana, in an interview conducted after he had escaped from prison on two occasions. This is the second time that this biohazardous villain, who was named public enemy number one by the Chicago Crime Commission in 2013, has escaped from captivity to resume his wicked way of life. How many thousands of people have lost their lives in his hedonistic and narcissistic pursuit of power and money? However, let us not blame it all on El Chapo because this monster requires a particular environment to thrive therein. El Chapo is just a symptom of an incurable cancer that is ingrained in Western culture and society. Pop culture magazines, like Rolling Show, provide rockstar exposure to dehumanized scum like El Chapo which is not only indicative of the debased state of media but it is also indicative. Due to supply and demand of what humans consider as newsworthy. It will not be too long before El Chapo is selling his perverted biographical rights to the highest bidder in Hollywood. And masses of people will be queuing in cinemas to celebrate his villainous lifestyle collectively. Only in a depraved and highly corrupt society can a convicted monster prosper both financially and egotistically. Islam and its legal-based objectives Before we delve into the rights to universally define who or what decides human rights, let us first familiarize ourselves with the Islamic position on the sanctity of life and the legal contingencies it has put in place for taking life. Like any religion, Islam has legal-based objectives that are set in place for the well-being of humans and to protect them from the harms of this world and, more importantly, the harms of the hereafter. These legal-based objectives in Islam are outlined in the following verse. O Prophet, when believing women come to pledge allegiance to you, as occurred at the time of the conquest of Makkah, that they will not associate anything as partner to Allah. But they will worship him alone, nor steal, nor commit adultery, nor kill their children in accordance with the custom of the people of ignorance nor attribute to their husbands their children from adultery, no go against you in any righteous thing such as his prohibition from wailing, shaving off hair and tearing garments. Then, accept their pledge of allegiance and seek forgiveness for them from Allah for their sins after they pledge allegiance to you. Allah forgiving to those servants of his who repent to him and he is merciful to them. al mumtahana 12 The statement that they will not associate anything as partner to Allah, but they will worship him alone demonstrates the preservation of religion because giving Allah his right to be worshipped alone is the essence of preservation of religion in Islam. The statement and will not steal demonstrates the protection of wealth because nothing stands in opposition to the protection of wealth more than stealing. The statement and will not commit fornication demonstrates the safeguarding of lineage because nothing erodes at the values of lineage and the family structure quite like fornication. Adultery and any other form of sexual immorality. The statement and will not kill their children demonstrates the sanctity of life. As for the fifth legal objective in Islam then it is intellect which does not exist outside of the preservation of human life because intellect is an integral quality of a human. Sheikh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah made this statement before introducing these legal-based objectives. Indeed, the Islamic Sharia has come to achieve and complete all things that serve an interest for the well-being of people and to repel and reduce all things that are detrimental to their well-being and to choose the greater good if both cannot be achieved and to repel the greater evil if both cannot be deterred.
and from the legal-based Islamic objectives is preservation of the five universal maxims which all of the messengers of Allah have an unbroken tradition of upholding and enforcing. They are religion, life, intellect, lineage, wealth, honor, and from them is ease in times of hardship. Minhaj as Sunnah and Nabawiyyah, 147. An interesting part of the above quote is, to choose the greater good if both cannot be achieved and to repel the greater evil if both cannot be deterred. Because this is where Western law falls head first into a social dilemma when faced with deciding between lessening the greater evil and choosing the greater good. The Michael Wheatley disaster is indicative of the dilemma that Western law is regularly confronted with which results in a failure to protect its citizens or deter them from criminal behavior. A symptom of this social dilemma is a self-absorbed outlook on human rights, in the interests of maintaining an overly liberal outlook on life, which consequently fails in many cases to positively discriminate between criminals and victims. Islam does not have an overly liberal or even a liberal outlook on life because in Islam there is nothing that requires reform in the name of progress and enlightenment. Thus, what was good for the Muslims 1,400 years ago is good for the Muslims today because Muslims believe that Islam is the religion of God who has the divine attribute of omniscience. Islam is so in tune to blocking the means to a greater evil that the West could learn a lesson or two. For example, that right to offend others, no matter how provocative, in celebration of the freedom of expression. The Charlie Hebdo likes to see itself as a victim of upholding the freedom of expression when in reality it was a victim of the senseless right to express anything no matter how provocative or offensive to the sensibilities of others it may be. This is not only extremely naive and completely irresponsible it is also arrogant with a self-centered attitude that you would only expect from an adolescent person. Which is merely an amendment to the night to do as one pleases. The Quran states to the Muslim believers. O believers, do not insult the idols that they worship alongside Allah, even though they be deserving of that, for then the idolaters due to ignorance would insult Allah unknowingly. May he be glorified. Just as he made their misguidance fair seeming to them, he makes the behavior of every nation, be it good or bad, seem good to them and so they act accordingly. Then their return on the day of rising is to their Lord, who will inform them about what they used to do in the world and repay their actions. Alanay with Macron M 108. Ibn Taymiyyah states regarding this verse Allah the Almighty has prohibited insulting false deities, despite the fact that doing so is an act of worship, as this could be a means for them to insult Almighty all. The benefit of not reviling false deities has more in its favor than that of our reviling them. Bayin ad Dalil al Butlan at Talil. With regard to these legal based Islamic objectives, namely, religion, life, intellect, lineage, wealth, and honor, it is safe to say that not many people, in their right minds, would disagree with the legality of these objectives in Islam. And most would accept that they are legal objectives shared by all present and past nations. Imam ash said, the, Muslim, nation, rather all nations are in agreement that legal systems place down laws for the preservation of the five essentials, and they are religion, life, lineage, wealth and intellect. However, with the swift rise of secularism in the West and the demise of religion, many would definitely dispute the order of these objectives, especially the ranking of religion before life. So let us get straight to it and ask the question, why religion before life? Well, before we can even answer that question, we must firstly qualify the word religion. The word religion is seen in various religions, such as Islam, Judaism, and in various parts of the world as inclusive of life in its entirety. In fact, as Karen Armstrong argues, the Oxford Classical Dictionary firmly states, no word in either Greek or Latin corresponds to the English religion or religious. Dot. Armstrong further argues. Before the modern period, religion was not a separate activity, hermetically sealed off from all others. Rather, it permeated all human undertakings, including economics, state-building, politics and warfare. Before 1700, it would have been impossible for people to say where, for example, politics ended and religion began. Of course, part of the reason for the ubiquitous Western notion of religion, as a purely private pursuit, essentially separate from all other human activities, and especially distinct from politics, is that secularism NES such a notion.
Armstrong argues that secularism has been cast as so natural to us that we assume it emerged organically. As a necessary condition of any society's progress into modernity, as opposed to being a distinct creation which arose as a result of a peculiar concatenation of historical circumstances. Moreover, the fairly recently creation of secular institutions and state required the development of an entirely different understanding of religion. One that was unique to the modern West. Ironically, this innovative understanding of religion, which the advent of secularization required, was given by the German Christian theologian. Martin Luther, 1483-1546, who famously rejected Catholicism and helped initiate the Protestant Reformation. Luther developed an understanding of religion as an essentially subjective and private quest over which the state had no jurisdiction, an understanding which would be the foundation of the modem secular ideal. Luther became, in the words of Armstrong, the first European to propose the separation of church and state. Unsurprisingly, the only tradition that satisfies the modern Western criterion of religion as a purely private pursuit is Protestant Christianity, which, like our Western view of religion, was also a creation of the early modern period. From an Islamic perspective, the meaning of religion in Islam. The criminality and stubbornness of the Jews and the Christians is evident in that they have not been commanded in this cure. Except to do those very things they have been commanded to do in both their books, i.e. worshipping Allah alone, refraining from ascribing partners to him, establishing prayer and giving in zakat. So whatever they have been commanded to do, is actually the straight religion in which there is no deviance. al a 5 the word religion in Islam does not refer to the preservation or free flourishing of all religions known to man because that would be counterintuitive and productive to the purpose of a religion. That is supposed to serve as the path that leads to the one true God. If God is one. Some might argue that the premise of this argument starts with two unsubstantiated assumptions, that, one, God exists and, two, God is one. The first of the two assumptions does not have to be proven to substantiate the logical incoherency of a plurality of gods. The Qur'an address the fanciful notion of there being more than one God. Allah has not taken a child as the disbelievers claim, nor is there any true deity alongside him. If there were to be any true deity alongside him, every deity would take his share of the creation he made and they would dominate one another, causing the order of the universe to become corrupt. The reality is that none of this has occurred, proving that the true deity is Allah alone. He is pure and holy of what the idolaters describe him with, namely partners and children which are unbefitting for him. 23 hours 91 minutes. A plurality of gods would allow for chaos. Indeed, if there were two all-powerful beings then either one could overpower the other, hence only one being can be all-powerful. Or neither being could overpower the other, hence no being would be all-powerful. So the idea of a plurality of gods is either inherently incoherent or it leads to the negation of an attribute which is a required in defining God, namely omnipotence. Then it stands to reason that his religion is one, and if his religion is one then all other religions besides God's religion are not only false but are obstacles in the path of God's one religion. We can hear the dissenting voices of the atheists saying, wait a minute, what if we don't believe in God? Doesn't that undermine the very premise of your argument? If right now we were arguing for the existence of God then yes, but as of now. We are simply attempting to build a bridge of understanding during times when bridges are being burnt. The goal here is to enable a Western mindset to appreciate things from a Muslim's way of thinking. A Muslim thinks that if someone has complete conviction in something being a universal and indisputable truth, namely Islam, why would he allow the propagation and dissemination of anything that can divert the masses away from said universal truth? Honestly, what would that say about his conviction in what he holds as truth? We believe the only way to circumvent the undeniable logic in the above question is by pulling the rug from under the claim of it being universal or being the truth. Islam is very emphatic and unequivocal when it comes to spelling out to humans their purpose in life. The Qun states, And I did not create jinns and men except for my worship alone. I did not create them to make a partner for me. I do not want any provision of them nor do I want them to feed me. Allah is the provider for his servants, all of them are in need of his provision, he is the supreme lord, every mighty, nothing is outside his ability. All of the jinns and men submit to his power, may he be glorified. Ad Dariat 56 58. Jinn. Worship, the term, worship, in Islam contains a very comprehensive deceptive meaning. 
Sheikh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah said when defining the general meaning of the term worship. Submission to Allah out of love and veneration by doing his commands and avoiding his prohibitions in a manner that is prescribed by the Sharia. Thus, it stands to reason that if God created us to worship him then he would reveal to us, through prophets and messengers, how to worship him. And right there we have a convincing reason for why religion is the number one legal objective of Islam and why all other objectives play a collective role in serving this objective that establishes. The right of God over his creation and the right of man over his creator. The Prophet said to one of his companions, Mu'adh ibn Jabal. O oh Mu'adh, do you know what Allah's right over his slaves is? I said, Allah and his messenger know best. The Prophet said, to worship him alone and to join none in worship with him. Do you know what their right over him is? I replied, Allah and his messenger know best. The Prophet said, not to punish them, if they do so. Shahi al-Bukhari The right of God in Islam is that he be worshipped alone. And the right of humanity is that they are provided the utmost right to fulfill God's divine right so as to avoid violating his right and suffering the consequences. With all this in mind, it should become clear why religion, namely Islam, sits at the summit of all Islamic objectives because a Muslim's purpose in life is not just to live for the self-designated purpose of gaining wealth, status or honor. Rather, he lives to worship and serve the one who gave him the gift of precious life, which in turn gives noble purpose to life, honor and wealth and lineage. It states in the Qun. O people! Indeed, I have created you from one male, your father Adam, and one female, your mother Eve. Therefore, your lineage is the same, so some of you should not take pride in lineage over others. Then, I made you into many nations and dispersed tribes, so that you may recognize one another, not so that you take pride in them, because pride can only be due to Allah consciousness. Indeed, the most noble from among you according to Allah is the one who is most mindful of him. Indeed, Allah is aware of your conditions, knowing of what levels of perfection and deficiency you are on, nothing is hidden from him. Al-Hujurat, 13 When we contrast the Islamic position with the right to practice religion from a secular or democratic point of view, we will see that this right is not in recognition of God's right because God's divine right is to be worshipped alone and not that anything can be worshipped as God. Rather the democratic, liberal right to practice any religion and worship any god is a tenet of secularism which serves as an extension of man's right to do as he pleases. This leads us to a popular argument which religionists, secularists and even atheists try to use against Islam. This specious, but popular, argument goes something like this. We in our tolerant, permissive, western societies allow the Muslims to build masjids and practice their religion openly but the Muslims do not extend the same courtesy to us when we wish to build churches in Saudi and therefore this proves how intolerant Muslims are. Is this really a case of intolerance or a case of mistaken expectations? Islam is theocratic not democratic, so why are we expecting an equal portion of tolerance when both are founded on different ideologies? If Muslim countries, like Saudi, were founded on Western principles, such as democracy, liberalism and secularism, then the above argument would not only establish Saudi as democratically intolerant, but it would also question the very existence of democracy in these Muslims countries. Secular liberalism, by definition and nature, can accommodate for virtually anything, but that is not the case for a conservative theocracy that only recognizes one God and one religion. You cannot argue a double standard if a standard is not promoted by both. Let us be more specific why is it intolerant to allow a religion or ideology that fundamentally opposes the religion of Islam to flourish openly and freely. Christianity teaches that Jesus, who was a man, is God or Son of God, which is a doctrine that not only contradicts the very essence of Islam but also contradicts the very definition of God. The real weird thing is that a Christian Unitarian would agree with us. It seems here that the phrases, remaining principled and, loyal to one's religion, are being conveniently replaced with the self-serving term, intolerant. Did the Americans during the Cold War have a welcoming attitude towards communism when it was knocking at their door? Or did it view communism as a clear and present danger to the values and precepts of democracy and the American way of life? Did they not view anyone who spouted communist beliefs as an enemy of the state and who has committed the crime of high treason? 
Could this not be a true case of intolerance, especially given that America is meant to be the land of the free, the land of democracy? If not, why not? No matter the why, we guarantee that the same rule of thumb can be applied to Muslims countries, like Saudi Arabia Muslim countries, like Saudi Arabia. In Islam, religion comes first because it is God's right to be worshipped alone, and life comes second because life was granted in recognition of this divine right. Say, O Messenger, my prayer and sacrifice is for Allah and in His name, not for anyone else. My life and death is only for Allah, the Lord of all creation, and no one else has any share in that from me. He, may he be glorified, has no partner. There is no one else worthy of worship besides him. Allah has instructed me to accept this pure monotheism and I am the first of those who acknowledge him in this nation. Al-Anam 162-163 This runs completely contrary to the motto of the freethinker and the materialist. And the disbelievers who denied the resurrection said, There is no life besides this worldly life of ours, so there is no life after it. Generations die never to return and other generations come to life. And only the alteration of the night and day is what makes us die. They have no knowledge for their denial of the resurrection. They are only assuming, and assumptions are of no benefit to the truth. al 24 These two verses capture the essence of two converging world ideologies that are fundamentally incompatible. So, does putting religion before life undermine the sanctity of life?